Gabrielle and I have had the pleasure of traveling to many different countries uh, over the years. And one of the things we love about visiting different places is experiencing the food and the culture, but also the celebrations. And we've had the joy of seeing different cultures, different places celebrate in amazing ways. But by far and away, the most memorable, the most amazing, the most fun is the Songkran Festival in Thailand, the Thai New Year. And essentially, it is a multi-day nationwide water fight. It is just water, water everywhere. You'll be driving along the road on your scooter and there'll be some kids there with buckets of water and they will just perfectly time a gentle toss so that you just get creamed by it as you drive past. There are people with water guns everywhere. In the big cities, people will drive around with like a, a tarpaulin in the back of their utes. They'll fill that thing up with water and just be throwing buckets at passers-by and it goes on for days. Gabs and I had a great time doing this and there was a moment uh, when we were at this festival together where I just fell more deeply in love with my wife and it's where she saw an old man, probably in his 80s, maybe even his 90s, just walking down the street and he was largely being left alone. But I saw my wife eye him up and she picked up a bottle, b- bucket of water and she smashed this octogenarian full on with water. And I think I knew in that moment that even God wouldn't forgive her for that it was just a moment of uh <laughs> of delight he was in on it right like i'm making it sound bad if you're walking around thailand during song Kran, you're going to get wet but i love these celebrations i love these just different expressions of you know festivity in different cultures and many different cultures have their own and i've been wondering about what celebrations we have as followers of jesus What are the festivities? What are the things that we just, we let our hair down about? Now think about the resurrection and like this day, this day is the biggest day on the Christian calendar. And I think for Kiwis in particular, but probably more like in our Western Pākehā context, we don't really let our hair down for much. We don't really get too overexcited about a celebration. I don't know whether it's a fear of, of what people think or, or seeing, seeming inauthentic if we you know, go a little bit nuts about something. But when I think about the resurrection, if we don't let our hair down, if we don't dance, if we don't sing, if we don't cheer, if we don't feast, if we don't make a big deal about it, I think we're really missing out on something. I think we're missing out on the opportunity to go, this is huge. This day changes everything. And if all it is is reduced down to some chocolate eggs, some buns, and a long weekend away, I think we strip the resurrection of some of its power and its joy and our experience of it. In Psalm 118, 24, In the ESV version, it says, This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And probably many of you might have heard that that verse before. That verse is in context of talking about this day. For a lot of church history, this verse has been used to herald, to bring in, to welcome in Resurrection Sunday, because this day, the day that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, was a day that He ordained that God has made, that God planned from eternity past. He ordained today to happen. And our response to that gets to be rejoice and be glad because this is the day that he wanted to happen. And so today I want our overarching theme, our feeling, our our, um, delight to be celebration celebration of Resurrection Sunday because, as we'll see from our scripture today, it proves God's faithfulness. It proves God's faithfulness. And we're continuing, we're wrapping up our Easter series today. We've looked at the, the Psalms of Easter, the six Psalms that Jesus and his disciples would have sung at the Last Supper, the six Psalms that Jews had sung at the Passover for centuries beforehand. We've done 113 through 116, and today we finish with 117 and 118. So those first four were sung before dinner. So for our context here, dinner has been served and is finished. 
Jesus has instituted communion. He's told his disciples, here's the bread, here's the wine. Every time you take this, remember me. I'm not going to take this again until I come back in fulfillment of my father's kingdom. And Judas has left. He has left to betray Jesus. And we know that they're about to sing because there's a little verse in Matthew 26 that you might have read a few times and maybe skipped over it, but it says, when they had sung a hymn, then they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Psalm 117 and 118 is that hymn. So let's start with 117. This is the first song that Jesus would have sung after dinner, and it says, Praise the Lord, all you nations, extol him, all you peoples, for great is his love towards us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. There's that word, faithfulness. Faithfulness. What does it mean for God to be faithful? One biblical scholar puts it like this. He says, the faithfulness of God means God is unchanging in his nature. True to his word, he's promised salvation to his people and he will keep his promises forever. He is worthy of eternal trust no matter how unlikely his promises may seem. And nothing in heaven or on earth can prevent God from accomplishing everything he has promised through Jesus. God's faithfulness means he is unchanging. He will accomplish everything he has set out to do. And everything he said he will do will find its fulfillment through Jesus Christ. This is what we talk about when we talk about his faithfulness. And that word here in here is in Psalm 117. Interestingly, the shortest psalm and the shortest chapter in the whole of the Bible. And it calls for, for the whole world to praise Yahweh. It says, all you nations, all you peoples, praise Yahweh because of his great love and his faithfulness. And in this original context, this is a call from Israel to the surrounding nations to acknowledge that Yahweh is the one true God saying, forget about your, your idols of stone and, and wood and gold and silver that Simon had mentioned last week. It says, bring your attention, bring your praise to the one God of heaven. But it has a, it has a bigger stretch than that. In this, ver in this psalm, we see that the seed of the gospel is sown here for a message that will, is not just for Israel, but a message that will go beyond the Jewish people to acknowledge that there is going to come a day when all the nations can come into relationship with this living God. And this is what Simeon, the old man who saw baby Jesus, mentions in Luke chapter 2 when he says, My eyes, he's talking to God, my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, that's non-Jews, and the glory of your people, Israel. God promised that one day salvation would come to the ends of the earth, to all people, to the whole of humanity. And this is one of the things we celebrate on Resurrection Sunday, that because of Jesus, because he went to the cross and died in our place, because he didn't stay in the grave but was raised from the dead, he flung wide the gates of salvation to all of humanity, to all who would believe. And that's why in Revelation chapter 7, 9, when John has a vision of heaven, he says, Around that throne I saw a great multitude that couldn't be counted, people from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Because of Resurrection Sunday, this means that Pakeha and Māori from New Zealand, Aborigines from Australia, Shan and Karen from Myanmar, Tamil and Sinhalese from Sri Lanka and every other nation. There will be people from every language and tribe present only because Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. See the all-encompassing faithfulness, the spread of salvation, the spread of the gospel and what Jesus accomplished on that day is worthy to be celebrated. And I wonder what it would have been like for Jesus to sing those lyrics of Psalm 117 just hours before he goes to the cross. Praise the Lord, all you peoples, all the nations. You know, even at the moment he's, as he goes to the cross, he has the whole world on his heart. And that means he has you on his heart. He 
he knows that because of what he's about to do, that salvation is going to go to the ends of the earth, as far away from Jerusalem as New Zealand. We're about as far as you can get. So great was his love towards us. When he went to the cross, he had you on his mind. In the words of Psalm 117, I love how one commentator says it, it kind of recoils back on us like the kickback from a shotgun. When you call on the nations to say, praise God, no God, it's then incumbent on us to tell them about him. There's an evangelical thrust to this message to if we want the nations, if we want the tribes and peoples from all across the world to come into relationship with God, well, then we need to tell them. We need to go. We need to share. We need to speak up about this message, this gospel of Jesus Christ. So from our heart, Psalm 117, we see the faithfulness of God to bring uh, the uh, the opportunity for salvation to the nations. It's one of the reasons why we celebrate. And we see this theme of faithfulness continue through into Psalm 118. It's a, a longer psalm, so I won't read the whole thing, but I'll give us a little bit of context behind the psalm, and then we'll pull out some things that we see about his faithfulness. In the first verses of Psalm 118, it, it reads like there's a, a single worshipper heading up to the temple in Jerusalem. There's a bit of a call and response. He's saying, praise the Lord, house of Aaron. And there's a response, his steadfast love endures forever. You can almost hear the, the intonation, the cadence of it going backwards and forwards. Um, in verse 27 of chapter 118, the worshiper is, is leading uh, everyone up and he says, there's a join the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. He's, he's calling people to follow him. Hey, I'm heading up to the temple. Everyone come with me. We're going up to worship. And it seems here that this person who's leading this procession, who's leading this, this flow of people up to the temple to worship must be a king. Because he uses military language, he talks about his enemies surrounding him. And he talks about God delivering him and giving him triumph in battle. In, in this context, in this time in history, that would only make sense coming from a king who would lead his army into battle. And so we see this king leading a procession up to the temple. But this king is also distressed. He talks about being hard-pressed on every side, surrounded by enemies, and yet still experienced triumph and deliverance because Yahweh was with him. And so it's most likely this king was David. There's a lot of reasons why that I won't go into, but we see a king heading up to the presence of God to offer worship because he's been rescued, because he's been delivered. And so Psalm 118 has more reasons for us to look at God's faithfulness and a number of ways in which we see it point forward to Easter that we'll unpack now. And the beautiful thing is that Psalm 118 starts with the word love. His steadfast love endures forever. But that word for love isn't like an agape or an eros or some of the other words you might be familiar with from the New Testament. The word is chesed which means faithfulness, goodness, kindness. And so what does Psalm 118 continue to say about the faithfulness of God? And there's a couple of things. First of which is, we see that God is faithful to be present with us in trials. And we see this in verses five and six, where it says, when hard pressed on every side, I cried out to the Lord. He brought me into a spacious place. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? The Lord is with me, present, here, right beside me. Even when I'm hard pressed on every side, even when the whole world against me, he hasn't abandoned me. He's not far off. He is with me. I will not be afraid. This is an expression of God's faithfulness. And it's the faithfulness that he promised in Deuteronomy 31.6 where he says, Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. We see this in Psalm 23 when David says, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, when I'm in the bottom of the pit, I am not going to fear. Because I know that Yahweh, that God is with me even now. And it's why the writer of Hebrews includes Deuteronomy 
this reference to the same verses, Deuteronomy and Psalm 118 in Hebrews 13, 6, where he says, keep your lives free from the love of money. Be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. That's Deuteronomy. And so we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? That's from Psalm 118. God is faithful to be present with us in trial. And so that means that we are free. We, we are, our, our lives can be free from worrying about possessions and, and safety and health because the most important thing for us is his presence, is his presence. But that last line from Psalm 118 uh, might seem a little bit confusing where it says, what can mere mortals do to me? And when you think about it, when we think about what happened to Jesus, he was slandered, mocked, tortured, and executed. Mortals can actually do quite a lot of harm to us. So why is God saying we shouldn't be afraid? It's because he wants us to know that his faithful presence is enough. His faithful presence is enough. And it's why Jesus' last words in Matthew 28 were, Behold, remember, I am with you always to the very end of the age. He wants us to know that his presence is better than a favorable outcome. His presence is better than a favorable outcome. So what does it mean for us to know God's faithfulness to be with us in trials? I love the way that Tim Keller puts it. He says, it means to trust God as God and as there. It means to see with the eyes of your heart how Jesus plunged into the fire for you when he went to the cross. If you remember with grateful amazement that Jesus was thrown into the ultimate furnace for you, you can begin to sense him in your smaller furnaces with you. And that's why you will hear testimonies of people from time to time of them saying or explaining that they've been to hell on earth the worst of situations and saying, you know, it was worth it. And if I had to do it again, I would to know the presence of God like I know it now. The presence of God like I know it now. And so this means for us that because of the resurrection, because of God's faithfulness, we can know that in our anxiety, in our sickness, in our unemployment, our relational issues, our financial issues, whatever turmoil you are in, He is there with you. Look to the cross. If in that moment, in the moment of his greatest suffering, he didn't get down, he could have got down and he didn't. He stayed there for you. And if he stayed there for you, is he going to leave you now? Is he going to let you down now because of your financial issues or your health issues? No, he will walk with you and be faithful through your trials. Isn't he amazing? Secondly, God is faithful to carry us beyond the grave. And we see that in uh, Psalm 118 verse 17. He says, I will not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. And I wonder again what these lyrics would have been like for Jesus to sing. I will not die but live. A few minutes later in John 14, 19, Jesus says to his disciples, because I live, you also will live. Jesus knew that he would die, but that it wouldn't be the end, that he would be raised to life again, and that it would mean he could guarantee eternal life for all who would follow him. And this is another thing that we celebrate today. The great adversary of humanity, death, the thing that people fear so much that it cripples them with fear, or they fear so much that they just don't ever want to think about it. Death. It's not the monster under the bed for followers of Jesus. It is going to sleep in the dark and then waking up in his presence in the dawn. Death is not to be feared because Jesus said, because I live, you also will live. In Luke 24, on the third day after Jesus has died, women who had followed Jesus went to the tomb and they found it empty. They found the stone rolled away. Some angels were there and they said, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. He has risen. Death didn't have the final say with Jesus. And that means that Jesus will be faithful 
to carry you beyond the grave through the death to be with him in his presence forever. This is his faithfulness. He's faithful to be with us in trials. He's faithful to carry us beyond the grave. And finally, uh, God is faithful because he has made Jesus Christ the cornerstone. And this is the crux of Psalm 118. It's found in verse 22 where it says, The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. Jesus Christ is that stone. Through his ministry, through his time on earth, Jesus was rejected by many of the religious, all the religious leaders and the Pharisees. They weren't who he was looking for. They were waiting for a Jewish Messiah, but they weren't expecting him to come humble and lowly. They were expecting a conquering king. And, and this idea of a cornerstone means that it's like the, the Jewish leaders were, were building something. They were building a, 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 a house and, and they found this stone. And they thought that's not fit to be here. That, that doesn't have a place and they cast it away. When actually what they'd done is they'd taken the very stone that the whole building needed to be built on, without which the whole thing would become crumbling down. They rejected the most important and precious stone for their building. This is what it's saying, that Jesus is the one upon whom God's whole plan for human history, for the cosmos, is built upon and without whom it all falls down. I've been reading a book recently that has some philosophical discussions and arguments about morality and, and the universe and, and a bunch of different things. And it, it's kind of, in some ways, um, taken aim at the Christian ethic. It tries to explain the Christian ethic um, in, in a not so encouraging way. And, and, uh, and it's, it unsettled me when I was reading it because a lot of it made sense. But it just nagged at me. I said, ah, how can he make such a strong argument by kind of stripping away the Christian ethic and saying that that stuff actually doesn't matter? How could he take aim at, at Christianity and in such a, uh, in some ways, it felt a very convincing way. And I was out running the other morning. I was turning this over in my mind. I'm like, ah, this is so frustrating. And then it hit me. This person had gone after all these virtues, all these things mentioned in Scripture, and didn't once mention the cross or the empty grave. No mention. And it is because this is the cornerstone. This is the cornerstone of our faith. If Jesus Christ didn't rise again from the dead, we have nothing. There is nothing. If the tomb wasn't empty, the whole thing comes falling down. But it was. That changes everything. Jesus said he would die and he would rise again on the third day and he did. That means he is God. And so what you say about Jesus is the most important thing you can ever say. This is what Easter is all about. This is why today is a celebration. Because you don't need to come to a bunch of rules. You don't need to come to the Ten Commandments. You don't need to come to a certain way of living. Jesus Christ says, I invite you to look at me and make your decision. I said I would die and I would be raised to life on the third day and it happened. Who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? That is the question Jesus Christ has for you today, Resurrection Sunday. Who do you say that he is? The answer to that will change everything about your life. Resurrection Sunday needs to be a celebration because it proclaims God's faithfulness in defeating sin and death. He provided a sacrifice, a substitute for us that we don't, we don't die. We get to live because of what Jesus did. He was faithful in raising Jesus from the grave. And he will be faithful to the end when Jesus Christ comes back to take his followers to be with him, to ultimately judge sin and death. And you know when Jesus comes back, what his name is? It says so in Revelations 19.11. It says, Jesus Christ comes back riding on a white horse. And the rider's name is Faithful and True. Isn't our God amazing? Isn't he amazing? He is worthy of all praise and honor and celebration today. 
Today is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. God bless you this Resurrection Sunday. I pray that you would go forward in joy, that you would lift your gaze to the wonder of his plan and that you would know his faithfulness in every aspect of your life.